Insert Ottoman hook blade has two parts, you see. You see. What's up, everybody? I'm the hook. And I'm the blade. And I am the bracer, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Together we're, you know. Welcome to The Adventures of Hookblade and Friends, a show about all things Assassin's Creed. Uh, with me, as always, is my co-host, Tim. How are you doing today, Tim? Pretty great. How are you? I'm pretty great. How are you? Wait, fuck. <laughs> Uh, joining Ooh. us as our first ever guest host is none other than the moldy man, the moldy myth, the moldy legend himself. <laughs> first name Putrid, <laughs> last name Moldy Man. Thank you so much for joining us, Putrid. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Putrid, tell me, why does having you on as a guest feel so wrong and yet so right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it feels like our time in... Remember back when we played Unity? Oh yeah, dude. And just talked shit for like an entire night. Yeah, it was good times. That's how friendships are built: is Unity, free roam, co-op, experiencing. <laughs> I think probably twelve glitches per hour. <laughs> yeah, it was really something like climbing up in the air. Yeah, good, good stuff. Putrid, You've you've been around the Assassin's Creed fan community for a while. You're kind of an OG, some would say. Someone would, would describe you as an OG. <laughs> probably, yeah. I started posting on the subreddit probably around the time AC3 came out. And you were like you were and... top dog on the subreddit because there were like there were ranks you could achieve through being a prolific poster and commenter and you had the highest one. And I think you were the first to yeah. get, it, were you not? Yeah, like they based the ranks on the amount of comment karma you had on the subreddit. Yeah. And Interesting. I guess they assumed that I had the most because I commented all the time <laughs> back then. <laughs> Basically, yeah, you're kind of a big deal yeah. is what we're saying. Um, I mean, Putrid was the first exactly. person I ever spoke to in the community ever. Well, that's that's cool. like one on one. I didn't know that. Well, no, yeah. No, yeah. Because you, you, in my eyes, you were like this prolific community member. And you, you are, still are. <laughs> well, geez, why don't you but, co-host a podcast with him then, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> but, well, it all, it, look, I'm going to bring it home, okay? Because <laughs> I right. was talking to Putrid, and him and I developed a friendship, and that's how I met you, Lawson, Aww. through Putrid, essentially. Thank you. Because I know that I messaged you separately, but when we actually started talking was through Putrid, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, I don't remember any of this at all, honestly. Well, because we, we would have those, it, have those Skype calls, you know? Yeah, I do remember those, believe me. I just don't remember anyway. how I met people. Like, I don't remember who the first person I talked to was. I want to say yeah. it was either Greg or, or Aftermath. Yeah, I think it was putrid for me because I followed him on, on Twitter, I believe, and I sent him a DM. I was like, hey, sexy. <laughs> 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 Putrid uh, also <clears throat> also was a team member on the Assassin's Creed Marathon, which, you know, yep. is my favorite thing. And <laughs> he was also a collaborator on the Bureau. And I think unlike Tim, you actually managed to get on an episode of that, didn't you? Yeah, you lucky Yeah, bastard. I think I got on. <laughs> yeah, one episode, I believe. Hey, that's that's one out of five. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My only goal for this show was that we beat the the Bureau's record of episodes, and we've done that. So everyone pat yourselves on yep. the back. Woo! So, Tim, last week we had some we asked we asked everybody to send us some hate mail. Yes. I want you to to read us the hate mail so we can hate them back. All right. So first up on the hate mail from Jacers Hobbs018. <laughs> Jacers Hobbs, you got to tell us how your username is pronounced because yeah, we keep, you gotta we can't tell us. keep saying it like this. But feature hate mail, <laughs> fan of the show, uh, <laughs> fan of the show. I meant to say not for, not fan, obviously, but whatever. Incoming hate mail. Unity's modern day is literally pointless, and it tells you as much. It is not better than Origins because at least something happens. You have crossed the line with that opinion. <laughs> I have to say this is tough for me because like I get like Unity's present day is just unequivocally terrible and I agree. At the same time, I feel like comparing it to Origins, Origins, there's like there's like 18 minutes of modern day content. It's playable. The expectations that you have when you see playable modern day, you think it's gonna be like really great Desmond tier stuff. Right. And it's so not, it's so bad. Whereas I think Unity, by the time I realized it was all gonna be cutscenes 
I kind of was like strapped in for terribleness and origins. I didn't realize how fully, how bad it was until I was done. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I agree with you because at least with unities, once you see that first little Bishop uh, bit, you know what you're getting into. You're like, Oh, the, they, they made it. They made it dog shit this time. Cool. cool, cool. <laughs> yeah. So you didn't get your hopes up, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to stand strong on my opinion here, but, but I don't know. I'm open to changing my mind if like... I'm presented with facts and logic. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. <laughs> um, what, else, what else do we have on hate mail? Um, so also from Bloody Mares. Um, this is uh, two hmm. of two on hate mail. She yeah. says, oh, I guess he or she. I'm not too well, sure. We, they say. They. Um, they say, hate mail. I doubt you can say that Syndicus Modern Day is the best we've ever seen when you compare a choreographed cutscene to the gameplay of Desmond wrecking shit in the Abstergo office and rescuing William. Brotherhood and AC3 Modern Day is still on top. Ooh. Um, I'm actually going to change course entirely and say that the best Modern Day is AC1, but I, I think Syndicate is easily the best we've had since ac1 i'm sorry but the the playable stuff in ac3 really didn't do it for me no it didn't do didn't, it didn't do it for me either i like the gameplay the fact that there's gameplay that's kind of a novelty i guess like oh we're actually killing people in the modern day which they did that in roughly every game i think other than maybe revelations out of those five yeah but is the actual story content compelling i don't know about that for for either uh ac3 or brotherhood i feel like ac3's modern day was pretty good mm. uh in the sense that wait hold on that, I, I, need, I need to come up with a way to phrase this take your time take your time this is why we pay editors <laughs> <laughs> we pay them in kisses okay <laughs> so i feel like ac3's modern day is good in concept yeah. but as with quite a few things in the story of that game the pacing was a bit of an issue yeah for sure I uh, I don't want to get too in the weeds yeah, on of the hate mail. We've got a big <laughs> subject today because essentially what's happened is um, we got a letter from Yves Guillemot, the CEO of uh, Ubisoft, and he was like, he was like, first off, sorry about all the abuse and harassment <laughs> and uh, misogyny that I allowed to happen under my nose for decades and decades. But you guys have a really great show, and I just want to know what you guys would do to save assassin's creed so our mission today is we need to save assassin's creed we have to come up with some ideas for what they could do next that would both fit the vision that ubisoft seems to have for the franchise but also make some you know crucial concessions to what hardcore fans are clamoring for or just really at the end of the day the things that we the three of us would want to see to be really happy about an assassin's creed game yeah because it feels like now more than ever at this moment, even um, compared to when we started this show, there are some forces that are acting upon Ubisoft uh, and on the next game in particular that seem to put it in a unique position, right? We're becoming aware of these sexist practices. The chief creative officer has been ousted and Ghost of Tsushima just proved that you can make a classic Assassin's Creed game and make money with it. So it feels like we have an opportunity for things to change for the better. So we've each kind of made our own lists of things that we want to see. And uh, Tim, why don't you get us started with the first thing you want to see to save Assassin's Creed? For sure. So something that's been apparent to me probably since the Ezio games um, is the lack of multiple games from one assassin or main character. So that would be the... And and I don't necessarily have a particular order in this. Obviously, some things I would I would pick over other things, but I think this is very important. And why I have it number one on my list is because I think it's you're 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 let, you're you're missing so much opportunity to not include an assassin over multiple games. Um, I mean, I you and I were just talking about how um, that like little graphic that they put out every year, adding in new characters and new assassins that thing is so filled up right now and it's because everyone in that graphic is going to get coronavirus because yeah. they are not six feet apart <laughs> but it's it's just it's filled to, to, to the brim because yeah it's like if, if connor had two or three games then it would just be connor there for three years worth of assassin's creeds but you know so it would feel more momentous to have a new character too exactly like, wow exactly i can't wait to see who the new assassin mm -hmm. is which is how it felt when they started talking about Connor after Ezio, it was like, oh my God, 
new protagonist. This is amazing. Right. And and then once once they had Connor in an actual game, it was just that game and then no word on him. <laughs> and then they just kind of drop casually on the side somewhere else. Oh, yeah, he had a kid, but his wife left him and he died yeah. alone. And that that's all we it's have so of ridiculous. Connor. I mean, actually, I think they've retconned that by now. They have they, retconned it in a comic. Really? They put out a comic about Connor, one of the, I think, Assassin's Creed Reflections issues. Yes. And part of the story of that is that the, I may be talking out of my ass here, but I know that part of the implication is that when the Abstergo employee handbook said he died alone, it was like, it was Templar propaganda, wasn't the truth. Oh, yeah. Well, also, though, well, I mean, but Putrid makes a good point that for a while... Before we read a fucking comic about it, Connor was just forgotten, you know, and he's like, fuck Connor, Absolutely. he died alone, you know? So, yeah. And that is pretty much what's happened with almost every other protagonist. Yeah, and when like, we see a new game coming out, like we see Eivor, it's hard to be really excited because I know that pretty much the entirety of Eivor content I'm ever going to see in my life will be over at the end of the hundred hours or so that I spend playing the game. Yeah. Like, it's that, hard to really get invested in it. I mean, obviously you can get invested in a character and there have been some great protagonists. Edward was awesome, right? I would For even sure. settle yeah. though, like like for a, an, a Kenway style family saga over multiple games. Like I would be cool with that, especially if they were smart about it and they allowed those other games to answer questions about, you know, to, to conclude the stories of some of those characters outside of their own games, you know? Have them be side characters. Wouldn't it be great if like, Someone from a game we've already played shows up as a, you know, cameo in another game or, or actually as a side character or mentor figure. Like, there's a lot you can do if you yeah. stay within the same story world for a couple of titles. And, and, and I mean, that, that, yeah. that, that's a big part of, like, why I think it's important to just stick with a main character or multiple throughout a few games because you can see the same cast of characters again. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's, I think what makes... The Ezio games in particular are very compelling is because you see the same people who Ezio has been fighting with for decades. You see them yeah. throughout the games, you see them age with him. And it's and I think and so when something tragic happens to one of them, you you feel it. And so it's yeah, it's hard to wrap my head around like, oh, who in Avor's life am I never gonna see again when I've spent maybe two hours, three hours playing with them before they before they bite the dust, you know? Yeah. And and I think that the the other thing, the bigger thing is that it sort of robs them of the opportunity to create iconic and memorable long-lasting characters. I mean, I do think that the reason Ezio, the primary reason Ezio is heralded as the the greatest character in Assassin's Creed, what I'll say is that if Ezio had only gotten one game, I don't think that would be the case. Um and that if other characters had gotten multiple games, they might be in that spot. Not that it's because Ezio is not a great yeah. character, but, uh, you know, there are things about him where he, he is kind of a stock character. Like, it's just the fact that we get to spend so much time with him and we get to see him through multiple stages of his life that we form this attachment to him and we consider him this epic legendary, not just in the Assassin's Creed world, but in gaming culture as a whole. Yeah, he's definitely just like a sort of standard likable character. Yeah if you look down on it, but they were able to flesh him out so much due to right. all that time. Absolutely. And then to go back to characters being in multiple games. Well, if you played rogue, you would assume that Shay would show up. <laughs> right. <in> Unity. <laughs> but I guess they didn't think to do that. Or Arno doesn't care about his dad dying. My thing, like the number one thing on my list, I think follows on pretty, pretty logically from your thing, Tim. Um, which is that I want to see in the next game a single female protagonist, no gender choices, just here's a woman, play as her. If you don't like it, deal with it. That's what 100%. I want to see. Because I think that if there's yeah. going to be a time that that will happen, it's now. Um, Ubisoft is going to want to be seen as progressive and not be, you know, derided by the games industry for their sexist practices. And I think that that means that not only is the likeliness at an all time high, I think it's necessity is at an all time high. I want to see it. And yeah, all the problems that we have with the gender choice setup, I think are pretty well litigated. 
in the sense that it kind of robs the character of an ability to have a distinct identity. If you could just swap to be a completely different character model and voice actor and retain all the same personality traits, uh, it just, it weakens the character in terms of how you perceive it as the player, I think. For sure. Yeah. And one thing that was very apparent uh, in Odyssey, and I'm sure it'll be in Valhalla to an extent as well, having so much choice in who you are, what the character is, it changes how the characters interact and talk to uh, the protagonist. Yeah. So they might say, in Odyssey, they would say Eagle Bearer. Yeah. At the very least, they'll say uh, Eivor now, but yeah. they still can't interact in a more well, proper way. That was actually one of my points, too, because it's just like, let these let the creative people stick to their guns and actually write a story with an actual character. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we are seeing, I mean, though, in some Valhalla footage that uh, they sometimes will refer to, at, at the very least, female Eivor as wolf-kissed. <laughs> so expect a bunch of that shit. Huh. Oh, boy. Yeah. I'm not looking forward to that. I mean, I can't say in my list, or I can't, like... I. Because like I said, part of the premise is that we are asking for things that feel like Ubisoft could do them next year and it wouldn't be completely out of the, you know, blue. So like, I don't think we're going to get rid of dialogue choices as much as I might think they should. Uh, But I think at least giving us a character that is fully embodied as one character with one design, one performer uh, and one story, I think that that would be. That would be that'd be beautiful, especially if they get multiple games like Tim wants. That really would be the opportunity if you're creating a next gen, uh, you know, only Assassin's Creed saga with multiple games with a single protagonist where each game is getting the development time that they need. And each game is getting, uh, you know, a well orchestrated story. Uh, that is the opportunity to create an Ezio level iconic character for all time. For sure. And keep in mind that because we know pretty much like at the moment right now, as we're talking, there are three Assassin's Creed games that are in development. There's Valhalla, the one after that, the one after that. Yeah. So if there is one single protagonist, that might in- inject some, you know, coherence. And they can all be like, okay, yeah. so like this game, this is what happens to this person. And then in the next game, this happens to the same person again. And like, I feel like you could have a lot of, uh, you know, just precision because yeah, writing is ab- flexible. Yeah. Like you're not worried about the third, like the, the third game in development because they're dealing, because they're not going to be dealing with a new protagonist, a new world. They're dealing with the same protagonist and, you know, so anyway. So, uh, putrid, what's number one on your list? Um, that can change by the <laughs> second, but, uh, <laughs> But one thing that I really would like to see is for the games to be, or at least in the future, to be uh, a bit more grounded into reality for longer periods of time. Because if you look back at, say, AC1 and AC2, you have stuff somewhat realistically going on, and then you have over-the-top piece of Eden fight at the very (laughs) end. And that feels like very rewarded yeah like, oh yeah for sure yeah, it, so it right. just it just comes out of nowhere and it feels really cool but then you go to odyssey and you have a piece of eden on you at all times yeah and so it doesn't have the same impact if you're just going to stay over the top at all times yeah if you're fighting a cyclops every 12 minutes <laughs> it doesn't it isn't going to feel rewarding or exciting to do any of that no i yeah, I mean, you're so right, Putrid, because... You're so right. You're so right. <laughs> because, like, Can back in the dick, day, Putrid? like, the pieces, of, <laughs> the pieces of Eden used to be, like, these mysterious objects, and now we have, like, a thousand of them that we know of. It was so cool to learn about a new one. Back exactly. The, like, it was like, oh, my God, there's an apple. Yeah. Oh, my God, you know, oh, there's a staff. Like, it was just, it was exciting to learn more about, to, to uncover the pieces, and now it's like... Oh, we made a new Assassin's Creed game. We should probably put a piece of Eden in there somewhere. I guess they not. I guess they like pieces of Eden in their Assassin's Creed game. <laughs> I don't know. What's this one? A blanket? <laughs> Maybe. This one's a sword. 
This one's a building. I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, when it comes to stuff like fighting a cyclops, that that was it. It's it's stretching yeah. it. It's really I mean, so much stretching that reality. Like it, because uh, uh, <laughs> but now we know it's gonna be in fucking Valhalla because you fight a big fucking timber wolf that's like twice the three times your size. You fight a witch. Yeah. Uh! Yeah. That I I was very I was pretty surprised to see that they were keeping that stuff in after. Yeah. So was the I. Yeah, some of the things they were saying too um, at the time. I feel like any. It's like they. It seems like they were implying in interviews and stuff that they were gonna draw back on that. Maybe. They will. I mean, it's not going to be, maybe it's not going to be like Odyssey where you're fighting a fucking, you know, mythical creature all the time, but <clears throat> still it's like, it's just so out of place in a universe that has existed for well over a decade to be like, well, also in some times, in some places there was magic. It's not about like suspension of disbelief so much. Cause I mean, you can point at anything and be like, you think genetic memory is cool, but now magic is out of the question. But the the thing is less about that and more about does the universe follow the rules that it has already established for itself right now? The answer is right, no, for sure. Yeah. Yes. hundred percent. That's one thing that I always really liked about the series that it, it stayed in its own rules yeah. and it had a sort of explanation for why things yeah. happened even like why you couldn't swim oh it's, it's Inter- right oh, dude you're so right you're so right <laughs> and and that was on my list too as i said <clears throat> keep magic and mysticism out of the main game and then go fucking nuts on a dlc uh, yeah like they sure. talked about doing a dlc for for black flag that would have had you like fighting krakens and skeletons and like mystical pirate shit yeah that was and i was like oh that's amazing because a dlc you can keep it self-contained you can explain it somehow like, I never played Tyranny of King Washington all the way through, but I presume it was like, there's a reason why you're turning into an eagle, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> it was well, an alternate yeah. universe, too. Is, a good example of that in another game is, like, Red Dead zombie mode. Or, or entirely, Far Cry like, Blood Dragon. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you could have a, a King Arthur DLC yeah. for Valhalla, and that'd be fantastic. But if I see, like, a Lady of the Lake in the main game, I'm going to be like, this is bullshit. <laughs> Yeah, but Putrid, for, 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 for yeah. what you were saying, I, 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 I completely agree. Because, like, even just swimming in the first game is explained somehow. And so, like, I, I don't need everything overly explained to me. But I think it's important to keep in mind that the mysticism used to be very subtle and very, like, ambiguous. And now they just use the mysticism just to explain everything because it's, it's in your face all the time. Like, as far as I am aware, in the Odyssey DLC, uh, in, in, in an Odyssey DLC, like, you are literally, like, in First Civ Atlantis, and you're just interacting with them, and, and like, that takes away all of the mystery. Yeah, it's, it's the sort of thing where, earlier on in the series, you wouldn't imagine that you'd ever see right. just straight up what the First Civilization yeah, would look sure. like. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, I don't know, it's like, the mystery is gone. Tim, what else you got? So, uh, number two on my list, I've got um, Encourage Exploration, mm-hmm. um, akin to maybe Syndicate's uh, World War One riff, I think. Mm. Um, and it's funny, because that's a more recent, like, that's a more modern Assassin's Creed game, as we would consider it, but it still yeah. kind of nailed the, um, in, like, the intrigue of e- exploration for that reason. So, I think there needs to be a, a greater focus on like, why am I bothering exploring? There needs to be things that populate this world that make me want to go out. And I think in more recent games, they kind of, they, they don't like to give you a good reason. They just give you a reason. I would like to <laughs> see like things that respect the player and respect my time to go out and explore. So finding like, <laughs> it's kind of like what we talked about earlier on the podcast of, like, the mysteries and secrets. <laughs> yeah. How about they are just mysteries yeah. and secrets, and I find them on my own, you know? I actually think Valhalla could do a pretty good job with this. <laughs> like, the animus anomalies seem interesting, and they could be very rewarding things to discover if it's giving you some modern-day content and some parkour content. Hopefully. Yeah. And I have a point that kind of goes off yeah. of that. Yeah. I'd like to see the parkour very much changed from what it is right now number two on my list behind single female protagonist is revive and revitalize parkour 
because in Odyssey, I'm not. It, it seems very similar in Valhalla. Yeah. But in Odyssey, it is just run and hold X, and once you get to a certain level, there's no fall damage. It, it's completely mindless when you get to that sure. point, and it's just like you could, you could climb anything without needing to worry about anything. It sucks. There's no need to think about navigation. This was something that occurred to me a lot when I was playing Ghost of Tsushima because it is a big open world and there's not necessarily parkour to be doing. Uh, but to navigate the world, you do have to find the areas that you can climb. The whole climb anything system in Odyssey, Origins, Valhalla, it seemed like a good idea, but it really just takes the fun out of exploring and navigating for me. Yeah, it, it makes navigation somewhat... It, it, it can even feel like a hindrance at times because it's just, oh, I've got to go to this other place in this huge world. And you're going to spend 90% but, of your time on a fucking horse anyway. That's true. Which yeah. Is, yeah. It's and also boring. I, I really like, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed in the older games, you had to look to see where you could climb. It, it kept your mind yeah. going as you were going from place yes. to place and it was a lot of fun. You had to like kind of find the routes and pathways you could take. It yeah, was, I mean, right was... now. Sorry, go ahead. No, you. Oh, uh, just uh, well. Right now, I I'm in the middle of AC one again, and while the parkour isn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, it or great. I I I I, I do find myself like being on a rooftop, and I'm like, okay, so I'm gonna go this way because that's where the buildings connect the best, and all that, and and yeah. so it does keep your mind active, and also I think what goes hand in hand with revitalizing parkour is also revitalizing areas in the map that can house parkour well. Yeah. Because even in, even in parts of AC three parkour, isn't exactly the most fun to do because the streets are very wide and the buildings are far apart. And And so slopey and you'll get shot. Right. Even like rogue doing New York did a better job of it than AC three by a significant margin. So it wasn't impossible to make that area fun to parkour. Right. Just, happen that way once you get to unity at that point in the series it feels like the way you moved in parkour was a lot more just luck yeah 100 (laughs) percent. rather than knowing how far you could jump and being able to there is some element of that i agree grab onto ledges (laughs) like grabbing onto ledges uh manually in a consistent way because i believe it's still technically possible yeah but yeah, I mean, what I, what I think it's happened... not really known how to do it as much. I think what adds to this problem is having, like, an automatic sprint. I know Lawson would disagree with me on this, but I think removing the need for RT and A at the same time no, I creates don't, this... I don't disagree. I prefer... I, I think I may have misspoke what I, when we were arguing about this the other day. I prefer the, the style of walking by default, but holding the trigger right. to run. I do like that. I don't like how the the one thing that I was criticizing about Assassin's Creed one is that the speed changes too. like, if I'm going forward and holding the right trigger, I should be at maximum speed. The a button should just be to indicate that I want to climb something. But in Assassin's Creed, you have to hold the trigger and the a button to sprint holding the trigger without holding the a button is faster than walking, but not the fastest you can go. That's my only complaint. Because yeah, so I think it was that way until like I, well, I, I think three changed it officially, right? I think three made it just the trigger, or am I wrong? At least three by three, I, but I it wouldn't surprise me if that happened earlier. I think well, because I remember Revelations I, is essentially the, is a, is very similar an RT and A, but I remember Alex Amancio specifically being like, we used to call it the Assassin's Claw when he wanted to change it for <laughs> Unity. He was like. Yeah, holding your holding holding down three buttons at once, but you like to call it the Assassin's Claw. So but he didn't I'm change that because you still have to hold that. the X button to indicate that you're free running up. Yeah, but I I think just general movement. You did, I don't know. I have to pull up the clip to make oh, sure I know what he's talking about. I if I'm remembering correctly, it was holding the right trigger, uh, the legs button, and trying to move the camera at the same time. Yeah, that's the claw. Because you had to basically put your thumb on the, the joystick and put your pointer yeah. finger on the A button if you wanted to control the camera while sprinting. That shit sucks. 
but yeah, like running at full speed all the time is, I don't, I, I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. I, I, I would prefer to walk by default, especially if the walk was a little faster than it is in some of these fucking games. Cause I mean, sometimes I just want to like walk and take in the, the beauty of the streets of Paris and unity but you pretty much walk like an inch per second. It's like, <laughs> it's like oh, this kind of, and there's no middle ground either, which again, like I don't think there should be in the way that there is in Assassin's Creed one, but it's like either walk at a snail's pace or run blazing fast through the fucking, I'm not an expert on controls, control design. I just know that I want parkour to be good and fun. And the only real way to do that yeah. is designing a system which encourages you to actually look around and think about where you're moving and then create a set of animations that are, you know, beautiful flow into each other. Well, the way that I, I think unities and syndicates animations do, I do think they should be new and more realistic and more, you know, detailed because they can, they should, if they want to revitalize parkour, I'm tired of looking at the same set of animations for the last five games, but also giving you just a little bit of control over the actual process of parkour such that you feel like you're doing something because the the more automatic it is, the less fun it is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think we could agree that no matter if it's, if it's like SEO games version of parkour or Kenway or unity, I think we can all agree that either one of those, we just want it to be present in enjoyable for everyone so. and focused on and, yeah. and made a part of the the gameplay design because i mean a lot of people I, I feel like the ubisoft teams they they have lost sight of the fact that for a lot of the general public and especially the people playing these games parkour and assassin's creed like parkour is the first thing you think about i was playing uh i think origins on my on my ps4 the other day and um my <laughs> My brother-in-law was was at our house, and he was like, oh, what game is this? And I was like, this is Assassin's Creed. And he was like, really? Because I was in a fucking <laughs> desert. He was like, where's the parkour? And I was like, dude, exactly. <laughs> dude, that's 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 so, like, accurate. <laughs> yeah. We're like, well, first, th first thing I think of when I think of Assassin's Creed is, is parkour. Yeah, it's yeah. like, where's the city? <laughs> yeah. One of the things that excited me so much uh, in the build-up to Unity is just the fact that they were talking about, hey, we're we're doing all this parkour stuff, we're we're revamping it, and I would love to have that excitement again of knowing that the parkour is being is worked being, on like, again. Treated well. Because yeah, yeah, I'm right with you on that. Let's see whose turn is it next. I forget. So I think well, because Putrid was adding on to something that I think. I don't know who was saying it. And then you were like, yeah, that's... I think it was... I think There's it was a lot of can. overlap in our lists, if you couldn't tell. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that's fine. That's good. I think that means... No, we... yeah, that's preferable. I'll, I'll go ahead and throw out something that was occurring to me. You know, Tim and I talk a lot about making targets and, and gameplay moments memorable. And I feel like they kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater when they sort of forgot about the whole black box mission thing. Because I get that what they tried to do with Origins is they said, well, the world is your black box, right? We give you a target and we tell you things about them and you go to the place where they are and they're doing something and you kill them however you want to. But by removing all of the sort of handcrafted elements that used to go into a black box mission of like, here are your opportunities, here are your points of interest, here are your points of entry, distractions, things like that, you lose the idea that there's actually something handcrafted happening at all and so every time you kill anybody in any of these last couple games there's nothing memorable about the circumstance the location the design the story because you are pretty much for hours and hours just showing up at a copy and paste fort and stabbing some guy who might as well be any other guy yeah that happened to me time and time again in odyssey yeah. I, I was just free roaming and I killed someone who turned out to be a cultist. And it's uh -huh. like, oh, <laughs> guess I'm a step closer to upgrading my spear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. No, I, I mean, mean, no, I mean, Boston, like, I mean, that's, that's, that's such a good point because that was one of the best things that Unity kind of introduced was the black box missions. And they were like, okay, never mind. And they still had a long way to go, I think. I, I mean, Syndicate oh, for sure. did a lot of great stuff with them. 
but it still felt like, oh, it's the same checklist you do in the open world, but but smaller. Like, I think that if they approach the idea of a black box mission with a couple of new ideas, right? One being expanding the area so that maybe instead of a single building being your black box, you might be in a whole village or town or fort or whatever. And the other thing would be integrating those opportunities in a way that you have to more naturally discover them, find them on your own, have strategies you can use to look for them. Um, the more that you have to exert your own player agency to discover those things, the more rewarding it's going to be to unlock, oh, this is a really cool assassination cutscene. Like, you know, we all remember that if, you know, in that Notre Dame black box mission, if you do the confessional kill, you are stabbing that motherfucker through a confessional. That's cool. You could have yeah. just air assassinated that dude. And knowing that you could have done it the cool way and you could have done it a, a normal pedestrian way made it more rewarding when you did it the cool way. Now there's no cool sure. ways. Yeah. Everything's dumb. <laughs> there's no <laughs> fun way to do anything because they have to all be systemic and open and, oh, and piss. I mean, yeah, I really, really feel like some of those uh, black box, like unique kills were some of the most memorable moments in their respective games in Unity and Syndicate, like the Notre Dame one in Unity and then the one in the medical facility in Syndicate yeah. where you like pretended to be dead yeah. and stabbed the doctor. Like, and those characters, a lot of them were memorable too. I'll never forget the Maxwell Roth stuff in Syndicate. Um, AC1, Sabrand was a really memorable one. Oh my gosh, every, like that's the one where I think... I don't know. I'm I'm mixing it up. Whatever the one is where everyone's poisoned, that was cool. Yeah, yeah, dude. The, that's the one I just oh, did. Oh yeah, that's the one I just did last night, and that's like it was so great because, and that's the thing. Ah, that's the thing about the black box <laughs> shit. It's like even in that game specifically, you like can do investigations as uh, uh, all of them if you would like. Yeah. You only need three to access the mission, but you can do six total investigations, and they give you new information. So, for instance, in this one specifically. The informant tells you, hey, the fountain in the middle of the of the courtyard, you can scale it. And so I knew that once it was time to pursue him, yeah. I could scale the fucking fountain. And and it doesn't matter if I just didn't know that and took the stairs, but I was able to access information that helped the kill be cooler and more enjoyable and whatever. Yeah. So and easy. Yeah, and the main thing so, is the reason they did the black box missions is because they wanted to get back to the core fantasy of that. Yes. And we have strayed exactly. so far from that core mm -hmm. fantasy that like they can show me a hidden blade and I'll get an erection. Like we're, we we're so <laughs> far off course that, that like any element of anything, which I didn't even write this down on my list for some reason, but my main thing above all, above anything else is that I want to be playing as an assassin. If they give me even like the dumbest, like Jacob Fry tier yes. bumbling idiot character, but he's an assassin and there's a real brotherhood and they do assassinations. Even if it's an RPG with wizards and monsters and shit, I will enjoy that so much more. I would really love to see an assassin's order and a protagonist with a beaked hood. Yeah. Yeah. yeah honestly, the beaked hood, man, beaked hood. That that's the thing is, is even in the, I mean, this is blood into the, like the comics too, yeah. is like the, the one that we just fucking read conspiracies, like the assassin order is in literally two pages of that fucking and it, book. And it, like, they don't And it made anymore. my nipples harder when I saw them. I know, but then they don't but pop But then they're gone. Anymore. I know. I know. <laughs> and it's like, it's like... <laughs> it feels like sometimes that they forget that the beat hood exists and is an iconic thing. It, you, you know it's bad when the first trailer for an Assassin's Creed game comes out. I'm talking about Valhalla. And it's just like at the very end, oh my God, it's a hidden blade. Yeah. yeah. Woo, social stuff. That's, that's the reaction. But you know what this means, and this is the other side that we have to look at, is now that we've been deprived of these things for so long, whichever brave soul at Ubisoft says, oh, that's what I want to do. I want to get back to that. As soon as that happens, we're all going to lose our collective minds. And it's like, it'll have been built up to. Yeah. Like, I don't give a shit about being a Viking. I really don't. They want to make the the world's foremost Viking simulator, and that's fine. But put me in that beaked hood. Put me in those Masiaf robes. Mwah. 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 <laughs> Speaking of, where, where's, where are the legacy outfits? Yeah. 
Yeah, Ubisoft. Where the fuck are the legacy outfits? You just give us Ezio every game and expect us to care about that shit. Oh, wow, I'm running around ancient Greece looking like motherfucking Ezio. That's so cool. Why, why, not, why not every other protagonist who's ever existed? Because you have 17 of them, and some of them look really cool. And I just want to be them, okay? I, it's not that big a deal. I don't even think there are legacy outfits. I don't even think there are legacy outfits in There Odyssey is an Ezio unlockable, I'm pretty sure. But that's, that's so it. annoying. That's so oh. annoying. That's, like, look, I, I don't want Alexios or anyone to fucking wear Ezio's robes. They they will disgrace them. <laughs> I, <laughs> but it shows you that Ubisoft knows the only character they've ever created worth a damn in this franchise is Ezio. Like, so why not do the same things that made Ezio great? You can do them. You're allowed. No one's stopping you from making a great character yeah, it's, and it's, giving it, us it, multiple it's like, games. It's like they perceive Ezio as like a fluke. Like. Yeah, it's, it's like it, they it, themselves are like, oops, we made an iconic character. <laughs> Whoops. Damn. Let's go ahead and do the opposite of what made that character work for the next 10 years. <laughs> if if in Valhalla I could wear every legacy character outfit, I feel like that would be cool. Even though I would not do it. Just to be clear, I wouldn't wear yeah. any of them. I would just like to know that they're there if I want to. It would make it the best game ever made. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a little random one I've got. I've been paying a lot of attention to HUD designs lately because something that really uh, really got me going about Ghost of Tsushima is that 90% of the time, if you're navigating and exploring, there's no heads-up display whatsoever. Um, and I just, mwah, 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 I love that because I could just sit there riding my horse through the hills of Tsushima and not see any shit on the screen that was distracting. I played a bit of The Witcher 3 the other day. There are so many useless HUD elements in that game. I don't know why I have to have a big old bar at the bottom of the screen that says horse stamina over it when I'm <laughs> riding my horse. Like, just let it slow down when it gets tired. I'll notice then. There's literally an icon in the upper right-hand corner that never goes away that tells you what time of day it is. I'm like, dog, I can see the sky. <laughs> I can tell what the weather is there's an icon like showing you an icon that says oh this is what a sunset looks like yeah i know the sun's setting in front of me <laughs> i can see it it seems that having a limited hud is something that they've been scared to do ever since the first game they're scared to do it i mean i well, know we've heard Ubisoft recently is... that sorry yeah they they want to treat us like babies is what you're well I mean, yeah I mean, the well truth. they're scared of you not finding a fucking viewpoint five minutes into the game and let's be clear, this is a game series that for most of its existence up until the last few years has literally had HUD elements that just tell you what the buttons do. Think about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. The puppeteer, like it's a cool concept, but if I get three hours in the game, I don't need to be reminded what the buttons do. And we've just let them have that on screen for like eight games. What the fuck? You're telling me I can press square and it attacks or assassinates? Whoa, hold on. That is, that is next that level matter. of hand-holding is what that is, honestly. And they clearly, they've realized that. They got rid of it in Origins. But I remember them, I feel like I heard someone say, I don't know if it was an interview or a leak, that it was like, okay, in Valhalla, they want to have a cleaner HUD. They want to have like more, you know, as, as, as small amount of HUD as possible. That's clearly not true. <laughs> <laughs> it's got just as much HUD as any other Assassin's Creed game of the last three years. So this is like a weird tangent, but I needed to bring it up. The puppeteer is really, really silly. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of crazy how the first game of the series did that pretty like retroactively, like allowed you to play the game without the HUD. Like if you're going through the uh, like the world, not the wilderness, but if you're going through in between cities, there's little signs that say this way to jerusalem or this way to Accra, and then if you the the point of a viewpoint is to get high enough to be able to see what buildings you have to go to it sounds like ac1 was designed to be played exactly that way and then ubisoft was like people are dummies you need to put big old icons on everything i think that's what happened i think i think that's exactly, I think that's yeah, exactly what happened. i think that's exactly what they did i think the game was about like was going to ship that way and they were like okay well hold on <laughs> we need to make sure that people wait can, dog uh, you want them to look at signs are you fucking stupid really <laughs> <laughs> so uh future what what's next on your list 
It's okay if you don't have a list. Fuck. You can admit it. I I do I do have a list. Okay. He's saying. just trying to figure um, out which one he wants to say next. Well, I just felt like I maybe yeah. didn't send you the memo that we were going to make lists, and then I was like, oh, God. Are oh, we spending this whole episode asking Future what's next on his list, and he's sitting there like, fuck, I don't have a list. <laughs> no, no, you, you told me about the list, okay. so I'm not just, like, trying to pull these out of my ass. I wasn't sure. Uh, I forgot that I told okay, you. It's yeah. fine. We're also at an hour of recording. This episode's going to be massive. It might, but <laughs> we'll be fine. There's stuff I can edit out. I've pretty much covered would, everything in my list at this point. Yeah, I've got three more in mine. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Rapid fire segment. <laughs> I, I would really like for both. Hmm? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> share, share with the class. What are you laughing about? No, just what the, the way you're like, oh, God. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Not just for the next game, but kind of going forward. I would really like for the stories to be good, good independently. Well, yeah, I would like these stories to be good. We said but I didn't like, think we were going to say that at the same time. <laughs> but I, I want them to be like good independently, regardless of the rest of the series, because so like especially in the context of the modern day, it's always kind of like stringing us along, but then like. Oh, we're gonna have the major story beat that was introduced after Desmond's death. We're just gonna relegate it to a fucking comic. Yeah. Uh, and we're not gonna mention that in the game or make that very clear at all. Yeah. No, that's a great point. Mm-hmm. So it's just if maybe I, I don't know the best way to handle that, but right. I, well, I, I I do know that say I know that this has been meant this game has been mentioned a few times before, but in like I think Red Dead Redemption 2 was a great they did a great job at having a story that's really good on its own, but if you played the first game, there's a lot of stuff that you would be able to pick up on oh, yeah. and know about. Um yeah. no, I mean to make the experience a lot better. I really like what you're saying because I feel like that's kind of a sentiment that I shared in the Brahmin episode that we did. Because Brahmin is a good story on its own and there are nice little you know easter eggs and stuff for the assassin's creed universe but it it feels like instead of devoting hours on hours just to like what can we put in here that fans are going to recognize they crafted a good story in the universe you know like you can read brahman or read the fall or the chain and you can enjoy them without having played every single assassin's creed mobile game that's came out you know and all that stuff (laughs) i completely agree with what you're saying yeah it 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 feels like maybe like have a plan you know in this in this game this will happen and the next game this will happen and then do that i i, I don't know but no i mean it, you're completely it right it would be better than what they're doing or what they have been doing for the past few years of we're going to use we're just going to string you along with the idea that something is going to happen but then it doesn't or if it does it's in a comic I was going to say this earlier. There is nothing about the, to my knowledge, there's nothing about the development process and what it requires that would stop them from saying, okay, here, here's our team. Here's our people that are going to oversee the Assassin's Creed, uh, you know, the, the brand, the franchise, and then creating a plan to say, okay, this is the narrative arc we want to tell over multiple games, whether that's in the modern day or that's in the present day. Or, Wow. Um, <laughs> whether that's in the modern day or the past, uh, you can make things overarching. And I think the only thing that gets in the way is actually Ubisoft's corporate structure, right? They don't have like a dedicated lore master for Assassin's Creed at all. And they don't have like, I, I think that really what happens is there are developers and teams that they pitch to the, the creative executives at, at Ubisoft. And they say, oh, this is the game we want to make. And then Ubisoft says yes or no. That process happens independently for every Assassin's Creed game that happens. So no one is saying, oh, the next three games we're going to make, we're going to hit Egypt, uh, Greece, and, and you know, Vikings, right? They're just these three separate teams that are going, oh, you know what I'd really like to do is make a Viking game. And then Ubisoft says, cool. But yeah, it's not like this would be impossible. The very first Assassin's Creed games was... You know, Patrice Desilet and Jade Raymond and those people saying, okay, here's our roadmap. 
Ubisoft said, do more. And they said, okay, we'll go from three games to five games. That's cool. And then now we're in this place where it's a free for all. But I really feel like the dividends that they would make from, in terms of like fan engagement and series goodwill in in the public and in the gaming community for just putting that effort in would be immense. Yeah, yeah. I completely agree. Thank you, Tim. Me too. Thank you, you trade. What was next on your list? If I had to pick multiple distinct cities behind a loading screen, and with next-gen technology, it'll be less likely, but still. Or one big map, I would pick the former. So, uh, Do you want me to argue with you about this? Because I'm ready to argue with you about it. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so I'll just lay out like why I think so. Like, Go for it. Because Especially with playing AC1 just now. like Every city feels distinct and has a dialect and... Uh, people look different the buildings look different the atmosphere the color of the sky everything looks so much different and new when you go between cities and i feel like that is lost on games like syndicate or unity and unity i'm not saying these games do a bad job of differentiating different neighborhoods or boroughs or what have you but nothing to me beats the uniqueness of those cities or ac2 cities and i think it's because you can't just waltz from one end to one city to another city. And I think, mm, ugh, excuse me. I mean, you can just, there's going to be loading screens. It's not just the loading screens, obviously, that make that so, excuse me, that make that so. I think it's the philosophy of that, okay, so Venice is going to be a lot different to play in than Florence. And I think as they've, and even, and like, I, I think this is why Rome isn't considered like the, the best city in the in, in in the games because it was the first game to go away from the multiple different cities that you would travel to and so even in ac2 when you go between oh sorry ac3 when you go between the frontier and and, and, and boston and all that like there still is a distinction between the two even though i, I don't love those particular maps as much I, I love constantinople and revelations but i don't think the games have hit on that kind of distinction between the maps since the first two games. I have a I have an idea that's like kind of similar. Mm-hmm. Um one thing that I really enjoyed is how um especially in the first two games, uh which was also somewhat present in Brotherhood Revelations and three, less so on three, more of the map opened up as you progress through the story. Right. And I actually really liked that because it helped you you, you you get more content and you don't feel like there's so much. Yeah, you don't get overwhelmed. Meanwhile, in Origins and Odyssey, after Cappadocia, I believe it's called, yeah. you just have the whole world open and it just feels like there's... Oh, Kefalonia. Too much. Cephalonia. Kef- well, Cappadocia is the burning yeah. underground in city in Revelation. Yeah. 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 The cave city. Shoot. Mm-hmm. That was so yeah. cool. Right. Well, so you see what I mean. Being able to travel between distinct areas like that is. And hey, Valhalla is doing that because you're gonna have some Norway they, action. You're gonna ha- you're gonna have I, Norway, I... and it's gonna be completely like separate from the map of everything else. I suppose, but like. Being able to go between Versailles and then Paris, like that's kind of what I'm talking about. Even though I don't think it's as di- it's it's obviously not as different as what I'm saying. But I I don't like. I Here's like- my thing. I I I don't think the loading screens are necessary in the in the next gen world. Like they'll still happen, mind you. If you're going to go from Norway to England, I'm sure there's some sort of transition there. Even if it's a cute animation of you being on a boat, it's not going to be like. You, you're, you know, it's not going to be seamless, right? Yes. But my thinking is this, like, you can have all of the goodness. Like, you can have everything you want. It doesn't have to be the, the old way or the current way. Like, I think that I would be okay with a big open fuck-off map like the ones of the last few games if the cities in it were really, like, content hubs and were, were, were substantially sized and that the majority of the content of the game could be, you know, enjoyed in those cities. That would do it for me. Like I'm okay with having an open world, like frontier esque area that can be exciting. Um, especially if there's meaningful content to do in it, but it really feels like even in origins and odyssey, though they make a big deal about the fact like, Oh, you can go to Alexandria or, Oh, Memphis or whatever. These, these big hub cities, those cities are like 
10%, not even 10% of the stuff you'll do in the game. So like, that's the problem more than anything else with that approach to me. But I do think that I fully agree with you on the level that if we could get back to a zone where we have like different distinct cities, I would be cool with that. As long right. as, and, and I do think they should use the whole aesthetic trappings that they have available to them. They should change the color of the sky. They should make the NPCs look unique. They should do everything they used to do in those games. Right. So, and, and I don't want to get I'm, too hung up on the fact that, like, they, there needs to be a loading screen separating them. I just feel like lately, in these big fuck off maps, the cities aren't given enough attention. And I think it's because they spread themselves too thin, they spread the world too thin. So, if I had to pick between an AC2 style of, like, three to four cities going between them all the time. I'm, I would prefer that over mm -hmm. here's giant world with a couple cities peppered throughout. You yeah. know, that's fair. What was next on your list? Uh, my thing is like, if there, if there are any boss like enemies in the game, they should be like the Templar Knights yeah. from AC one. I agree. Mm. That's it. Um, that's a cool idea. Well, cause AC one combat to me is the best. And it's so most wrong. it's most challenging so when you're facing wrong. enemies like that. It's like a really good thing about the Templar Knights is that you are pretty much forced to like stealth them. Yeah. And it's a perfect example of if you can't stealth correctly, you're going to be in for a bad time because it's very difficult to kill them um, outside of it because they're so very strong and very skilled them, warriors though, so are... you need like a you need a perfect hidden blade counter and in ac1 the window yeah, for that is it's very, very tiny, tiny. It, it, but also some of them are, are impossible to stealth because some of them are like up against a rock you can't like quite get that's it, true and, and there's not a lot of room to air assassinate in, in like the in the space between the cities there's not a lot to climb uh i yeah. think if you're talking more like you know if you have like smoke bombs and the whistle and all that and yeah now we're talking yeah um like not medusa yeah. templar knights yeah so i so my last point really is just to encourage side content completion linking it to the main objective so i think brotherhood is the prime example of how to do side content in these games because oh yeah it's all very um fun and enjoyable and there's a and there's a lot of it there's a lot of there's a lot to it for just from a quantity sense but it's all like linked to your time in Rome and with characters that you've spent with in previous games and stuff. So it all is linked to like, for instance, there's like 50 Paris stories. Not one of them I ever did and felt like, wow, Paris is a better place because I've done that. Even in Brotherhood, <laughs> you can renovate the, the city itself like you can help the city itself. There's a quest line in Brotherhood where you are just playing flashbacks of AC2. All of Brotherhood's side content feels meticulously crafted and rewards you for doing it, whether it's a gameplay or a um, story reward. Because wow, I know more about Ezio's life, and if you do, yeah, if you do the the Leonardo da Vinci War Machine side missions, it's like wow, I get to play with all these War Machines again, even though some of them are a little tricky to handle. But you get my point. Yeah. And you get the you get more exactly the more you by do, doing it yeah exactly like that yeah is you get so your crossbow perfect. and stuff like exactly that's exactly what I'm saying like there is this there is this um, tangible progression while um, you are doing all the side content and it also happens that with some of the side content you're interacting with characters who have been fleshed out throughout the previous game in this game right and, and you're doing stuff like for the factions that within the main exactly. story you're partnering and, up with. So it yeah. was a perfect and balance. And I think because, um, and I think because like your mission, as soon as you step foot in Rome is to liberate it and to make it a better place. All the side content for the most part is linked to the objective. The closest we got from to that was syndicate because it was also Jeffrey, Jeffrey O'Halem. So I think that was, but I don't think syndicate nailed it. But it had a similar like pr philosophy, and so I would like to see that again. And it doesn't have to be like a liberation story, or I am liberating the city. But I want my side content to like whenever I'm taking a break from the main quest line, I want to feel like what I'm doing on the side is still worth my time and effort. And you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. And then like 
it, there it was some kind of motivation to do stuff in Odyssey, but literally it was just, I'm a mercenary and want money. <laughs> yeah, they had to That's go the Witcher it. 3 route because it's like, okay, well, if you create a character who does things for money, then you have a really interesting, well, not interesting, really easy system to be like, well, you're going to help this fucking guy either way. The only question is, are you going to get paid for it or not? Are you a really good guy who's just going to do it for the good of your heart, or are you going to make the money? And I always choose to make the money yeah. because it's more fun. And just, but <laughs> yeah, and just last thing, like I, I know I talked a lot about, like I just, I do think Brotherhood has that de- has done it the best because there's a ton of shit to do in that game, but like even just going back to like getting like uh, the Brutus armor, like all of that feels yeah. like necessary. You know, because you go and do all those Romulus tombs, and guess what? You get a reward for it. It's not like in, in, in the Paris stories, you complete all of them, and to my knowledge, you get nothing for doing 50 repetitive side quests. In terms of... Yeah, just for Paris stories, you just get some exclusive gear sometimes, which ultimately isn't the best stuff by a milestone. Right, yeah. Oh, solve a murder for me, and you can grab a gun out the bin. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. Oh yeah, we just keep a lot of weapons in here. Just grab one. Yeah. So that's essentially like, I think bringing back like narrative linked gameplay progression would be attractive because like, and while AC one doesn't necessarily handle it, handle it perfectly because the game is kind of hard to play without certain mechanics, but I do like how over time you get new weapons and and better weapons and new skills and stuff. So if they could do that in a more streamlined way, I'd appreciate it. And also you have AC two where Ezio learns the climb leap through a character in the story, you know, and I, and, and I'm pretty sure it's like four sequences in that that happens. And it's, it's not like it's the start of the game, you know, and it's like, it, it, it keeps you on your toes. And I think it keeps you, the player involved. And I like the idea of like the gameplay staying fresh by new things coming at you, new mechanics and stuff like, and just like Putrid mentioned, um, but in terms of the brotherhood side content with you helping Leo, you get, upgrades and stuff through it you're able to purchase upgrades again so i don't know i think it's worth i think it'd be a worthwhile um effort yeah in terms of applying all this stuff to you know the future games these are all just things that would bring the games back around to feeling like they're at least accomplishing goals that the assassin's creed franchise had set for itself i think there's a really interesting discussion to be had about how we make these things fit with the ubisoft mo of like, okay, they have to fit microtransactions into these things. Where does that come into play? But we have talked for two hours about this now, and we've got a lot that we've said. Yeah. Hopefully, listeners, it all makes yeah. sense as uh, a conversation about, you know, what our ideal version of Assassin's Creed is. I think that's going to wrap it up for this week. Um, as always, guys, there are things you can do to support us. If you like listening to this podcast, like or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Leave us a comment on our YouTube video. Um, recommend the podcast to your friends who love Assassin's Creed um, or who just think it might be cool to listen to a couple of uh, of funny and smart guys talk about a video game. Don't forget don't know, handsome. You know, don't forget ridiculously <laughs> handsome, at least in the case of Tim and Putrid. Yeah, and come on now. <laughs> you're, you're the most handsome of the three of us. Disagree, Tim. You're a, you're a, a vision of beauty, I have to say. Um, no offense, Putrid. You're also beautiful. Thank you so much, Putrid, for joining us. Thank you, Putrid. Uh, on the podcast. Yeah. So, it's been so great to me. have you. And we hope uh, you, you join us many more times in the future. Oh, for sure. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on. We will uh, see you next week. Elegant design. Elegant design. Elegant design.